I'm going to give you a lineup that I had as teammates. Okay, just, now just imagine. This is my teammates in my career. Okay? Catcher Johnny Bench, Hall of Famer. Third base of Mike Schmidt, Hall of Famer. Shortstop and your teammate Barry Larkin, Hall of Famer. Second baseman Joe Morgan, Hall of Famer. First baseman Tony Perez, Hall of Famer. Left field Frank Robinson, Hall of Famer. Center field uh, Tim Raines, Hall of Famer. Right field Andre Dalton, Hall of Famer. Left hand pitcher Steve Carlton, Hall of Famer. Right hand pitcher uh, Tom Seaver, Hall of Famer. Is that is that teammates? the kind of teammates you want. Yeah. I got a Hall of Fame lineup of players I played with. You think anybody else can say that? I, this, this, I can't even make that team. <laughs> 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 I'm, a, this, I'm the utility player on that team. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, he will be missed. The hit king is gone. And... Uh... That was an interview we did a while back, and he just talked about some of the great players. He's been on teams, three-time world champion, 17-time all-star. But, I mean, that's that's the thing. Mike Schmidt talked about how Pete made him a better player and uh, talked about some of the things that Pete, as a hitter, was, you know, don't doubt yourself. Just be aggressive. Hit line drives. And I remember, and this is long before I knew that Pete, and Mike played together. So Mike Schmidt describing his own philosophy, I was like, okay, you know, where did he get that from? And then this was actually, I just heard this in the documentary I watched on Pete like a month ago. Um, and talking about how he went from the Reds and played from 1963 to 1978, 9-ish. I think 79, he went to the Phillies. So just think, you're, you're in one place for like 15 years. Now you go to a new place with the Phillies. And you seek out the best player on the Phillies at the time, which is Mike Schmidt. And you're and you and you make Mike Schmidt better by just your conversations on hitting. Now Pete wasn't a power hitter. Yeah. Pete probably had thirty eight hundred base hits out of his, you know, forty two hundred hits. But you're you're looking at a Hall of Fame third baseman that hit, had over five hundred home runs that believes that Pete made him turn the corner in his career in their conversations around the batting cage. So that's what I'm talking about. I mean, Pete um, was selfless when it came to helping everybody else, and he kind of couldn't help himself, you know, off the field uh, with, with some of his vices. But on the field, nobody loved to talk baseball more than Pete. Nobody knew more about the game than Pete. Um, in, in describing everything, I mean, just listening to Pete, um, when he was managing, there's, there's so many pictures of him just staring He's like got his arms on the fence and he's staring at the field. He's not paying attention to anything but the game. The coaches, the coaches on the other team, the players, and and then you'd walk over and he'd be like, Look at this guy, look at this shortstop. Now what what do you think about this? And it was like a curveball that was being called. And he's like, Watch watch his feet and watch him go towards the weak side now because he's gonna throw something off speed, and he'll give away the pitch. I mean, he knew every little idiosyncrasy of every player on every team we played against. And he's like, listen, this is the kind of stuff you have to be a student of the game. He goes, and if you're a hitter, just think about that. If you're hitting, and now I see this guy go into the hole because you're going to throw me a breaking ball, that's the tip. I don't need to watch the pitcher. I know a breaking ball is coming by watching the infielders. And that was that was some of the stuff that I think, like I said, the reason I'm bitter is you've had 35 years of where Pete could have been giving, handing down baseball knowledge. Now, do I want him to talk about his life off the field? No. But as far as baseball went, that guy was an encyclopedia when it came to just every little tidbit of information was in his brain and 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 was in real time during a baseball game. He's, he's studying it even after like 40 years of playing it and, and being around it. If I was Major League Baseball, I would want him to talk about his life off the field because I think those lessons are very needed today. I mean, everything that Pete Rose did on the field and off the field is getting magnified with Major League Baseball in 2024. 
Like, gosh, talking about on the field. Uh, how about Otani and his guy, Ippy? That's just one. I mean, there's been five players in the last two years that yeah. have been punished by Major League in Baseball because of gambling. In every sport. In, in every sport. You're yep. right. Like, the NFL, the NFL needs NFL. this kind of talk for all of their players. And, you know, like, Pete's not the best messenger for it. But look at his life. But he's life. an authority. He's, right, oh, so, yeah, he knows. So, um, th- I don't know, the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio where he, like, you know, fakes his way and becomes like a fake pilot and all this kind of stuff. And then he passes bad checks and all this other They hired that guy. The FBI right, right. hired that guy because he was the foremost uh, authority on cheating and, and forgery and all of this stuff. So Pete would have been such a great authority on this, um, you know, this messaging. You know, and they do in the NFL. I know they do their rookie symposium. Uh, ba- Major League Baseball does it. But you need people like this to pass on even the worst thing. Listen, I, and I and, and it's what's funny about that. Again, we would bring in members of crime families, the Colombo crime family, Gambino, all these different crime, crime families. Bring them into spring training and teach the players on what not to do. That's that was their message. What, how not to get involved with the mafia? How not to get involved with gambling? They brought in Art Schleister, the the football player who got involved with gambling, was was doing all kinds of stuff with gambling. But for some reason, they just were so anti-Pete. Maybe his arrogance, maybe his pride, but they just didn't want to use him that way, which to me, I felt was a no-brainer. It's like, listen, the hit king's one thing. That's that's one thing that, you know, uh, you can't get past with Pete because he's very proud of that kind of stuff. Should but, be. But the other stuff, he also wanted to repent that stuff and and you know, make a difference in in not letting other people go down those roads that he went down, and and he was never allowed to do that. Do you think they're going to put him in posthumously in the in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame? I don't in the near future. No, I don't. Um, what I know, what I learned when I was working at ESPN twenty years ago was that Bud Selig, and this is crazy, absolutely crazy, because my father, while well, my father was still alive in the nineties. After Pete had been suspended in 1989, um, Bart Giamatti, who was the co- then commissioner, passed away about a year later after the whole thing of a heart attack. My father told me all of this stuff Bart Giamatti was involved in and was known for. It had nothing to do with Pete. And, and that was the way Bart lived his life. And so Mr. Giamatti dying, Bud Seeley got a meeting with ESPN and Major League Baseball uh, was was adamant that while he was still alive, Pete would never step in the Hall of Fame. You know, and Rob Manfred, who was the uh, heir to Bud Selig, is he's going to keep the same thing going. He's he's not going to allow Pete in the Hall of Fame because they're, they believe Pete caused Bart G. Monty's death. They believe Pete and his gambling and gambling on baseball was such a stain on the game. You know, everything that they're doing right now, you know, the the hypocritical stuff that they're doing right now with casinos and gambling and DraftKings, et cetera, um, th- that's okay. That's okay. But Pete's still a pariah when it comes to that. So, no, I, I honestly don't think they'll let Pete in the Hall of Fame. Just like, and, and again, uh, it, earlier on Dan Dockage's show, I said, it's not just Pete that belongs in there. It's Barry Bonds, right. seven-time MVP. It's it's Roger Clemens, seven-time Cy Young Award winner. Even A. Rod, all of these guys, they 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 did their deal on the field. Whatever you want to do to sort it out at the museum of the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, that's your business. I don't judge them on that. I allow again. You want to bring your kids in there or your grandkids or whatnot down the road fifty years from now. You want the whole history of made now all all of the awfulness as well. You know, the whole steroid era should be in there. All of this stuff deserves to be in there, not not on a positive note, but should be told. Whether it's like a history museum and you're talking about the Holocaust and World War II and World War I and, and the Civil War, all of that stuff and, and all of its awfulness, it's still history that needs to be told. So it's not just Pete. Does Pete belong in the Hall of Fame? All of these players deserve their, their due, whether you think it's positive or negative. And it's the same with Pete. Or Barry, or Roger Clemens, or Schilling, um, or Andy Pettit. I, I, honestly, because I watched these guys, I idolized some of these guys, like how good they were at what they did, and how hard it is to make it to the major leagues, and then be good for fifteen or twenty years at your craft. And did you? And did you grow the game? Like, like, forget Pete for a second. Barry Bonds. Did Barry Bonds grow the game the time he was a baseball player? 
Did Roger Clemens impact Major League Baseball? So that's the way I kind of judge, you know, somebody's legacy, not just numbers, because now we've finally gotten away from numbers and put some of these rightfully guys that should be Andre Dawson should be in there. Some of these guys should be in there. And and again, it's not the whole story isn't told if Pete Rose isn't in there. And like you were telling us before the show started, uh, I don't know about Pete's story before he hit Cincinnati Reds. Like, right. you know, I'm learning today about oh God, Buddy Blowbomb, yep. the bird dog scout that found him, was trying to tell everybody to get him in. And you were saying if he's in the Hall of Fame, it's not going to be, I'm Pete Rose, look at me, I'm no, the best. It's, it's going to be telling the story of how he got to how where he is. How such an underdog story. Right. That's, that's the story I'm trying to get out there. Not, you know... I know Pete just passed, but what I'm saying is when Pete was a child, he was always looked down on his, his, where his status, his financial status was his family. Um, as an athlete, he was always small, small, He's just too small. But he played football. He was, yeah. he lettered every year in football. He lettered every year in basketball, lettered every year in baseball. And still everybody's like, yeah, this guy sucks. This guy can't play at the next level. So it's, you know, so this, this guy is a success story. From that standpoint, again, so you see post Pete, managerial Pete, did he bet on, you know, again, I'm not trying to whitewash that at all. That's part of his history. Right. <clears throat> but his early history, when he's coming up, served in the military, uh, you know, served in the reserves. While he was in the reserves, he got a lot of his other uh, teammates involved. And this is during Vietnam in the mid 60s to late 60s. Um, can't remember what Ford it was. It was in Kentucky. And, and again, was very proud of that to the fact that, so if you saw the early haircuts of Pete, <laughs> yes. And they were yes. military esque yes. and people would go like, Oh wow, that guy's kind of weird with those haircuts. No, he was in the army reserve. That's what Pete was doing when he wasn't playing baseball. So, you know, there's so many sides of Pete that people don't understand. And so if you kind of, you know, you know, had a history more of him in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know, and those times were wild. And imagine all of this. I brought this up before. Pete never had a drop of alcohol in his life. Not a sip of champagne. Hard to believe, really. Not a beer. In that era. With in everybody. that era. Yeah. And, and then, yes, he did do some other things, but I'm not going to get into that because it's not my story to tell. But at the same time, you know, Pete Pete was had other vices, that were just as bad as that. So for me, but it, it, he did things the right way. I mean, the way he played the game, uh, and you know, to the way some, he treated people, right? The way he treated people, he treated you first class, even though you weren't going to treat him first class, if that makes sense. Um, he played the game hard, even though he didn't expect you to play it as hard as him. You know, um, Kevin Kernan wrote a great article on Ball Nine. We have Kevin on all the time. Maybe I got him on before the end of the week to talk about Pete because he was so great about this article. And the guy wrote the, the book that we just had on, the, the Keith O'Brien book about yeah, Pete. Charlie Hustle. Charlie Hustle. Um, Pete, one of his biggest uh, problems that he had with people was he was trying to measure up all the time. And, and he was trying to get you to measure up all the time. And what annoyed him was there wasn't enough guys to do it. You know? So that's why... When he's like bringing up these hall of this Hall of Fame team that he played on, and he's jokingly saying, "I couldn't have made that team. I couldn't have made the team that I was on." If if you look back at it and said, "Well, yeah, Pete, you weren't that. You weren't as good as any of those guys, even though he was." Let's talk about the fun stuff. Now, I'm dressed up in my Reds garb, but I tried to match on purpose. I wanted to get Kurt a pink Kango hat with a matching pink uh, polo shirt. Nick Federico should have been dressed you all in a white dress drum as poorly suit. as Pete Rose yeah, I mean, let's talk tacky, man. Uh, you know tacky, and you are one of the kings of tacky, yes. but you cannot hold a candle no. to the emperor because of tacky. Because some things I refuse to wear. <laughs> I mean, I did back in the day wear some all-leather outfits, which were hideous on me. Red hot. I'm not pretty, right um, but Pete used to wear silk pants, silk shirts, skin tight, and he was built like a, I don't know, <laughs> a right or left guard in football <laughs> and five foot six. Um, and then he'd have the bad bull haircut, which again, he became synonymous with the haircut just because, you know what? He was a no frills guy. And, and, and then it was like, okay, so you think you think I'm um, low class? Fine. I'll act low cat class while I'm a multimillionaire. I mean, that that was kind of the way Pete did everything to spite you. You think you're spiting me? No, I'm going to spite you. 
I'm, I'm going to still survive, even though you think I can't. And I'm going to have this bad haircut. Oh, my God. There were so many things that was tacky. Like, I was just uh, a friend. Oh, my God. Just pull that right out of the head. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, Norm, Randy, and myself went back to sign autographs last year in Cincinnati, the year before. Yeah. And uh, Pete was doing his autograph session before. He's got this mink hat on. He looks like Daniel Boone. So Daniel Boone would be wearing some kind of raccoon hat. Pete's got a mink hat on. Okay? And it's it's hideous. And the first thing I do is I go, Pete, what the hell with the hat? And he goes, what are you talking about? It's a $3,000 hat. Somebody gave it to me. So, again... If you knew Pete, it was to love Pete because Pete was like, he knew it was an awful-looking hat. It didn't match his awful-looking outfit. And then he's got on Cartier glasses like because he needs them for reading. Of course. But but the the solid gold chain that's probably worth $100,000 hanging from it around his neck is pure Pete. Yes. He's got an all-gold Breitling watch that's, you know why? Because it's more gold than a Rolex a gold Rolex, so it's probably cost more. Of probably cost 100 G. So that was Pete. I mean, everything he did was loud and tacky, but at the same time, he was a soft-spoken guy, and he would do little things for everybody that you'd never know about. And then, you know, like like when you're trashing him, he's already signed like a dozen balls for you over here. While he was calling you an a-hole and all this other stuff and making fun of you and all this stuff, he, he just gave you like $10,000 worth of balls right here. Tell people about, now you already talked about when he allowed you to live at his house. Nope. Um, tell people about when you walked into that house <laughs> and what you, like, you had no idea about the decor or what you're really walking this? into. Just pulling up, getting the driveway, the front door's pink. Of course. Okay. It's a $5 million <laughs> mansion on a street full of mansions in Plant City, which is kind of, it was out of the norm anyway, but it was where a lot of people, I guess, were hiding in Florida at the time. Walk inside, there's purple shag carpeting everywhere. The the, <laughs> the drapes that you'd pull, but they're hard, uh, were gold. It was like, I, you know, totally. I, I don't want to be disrespectful maybe to a pimp or something, but it, I swear to God, it was like right out of a 70s, you know, uh, I'm going to get porn. you sucker. 70s porn or, or, house. or a shaft, uh, you know, movie. And I, and, and it, but it gets worse as I go into the bathroom. All the fixtures, and I and I asked them. They wore twenty four karat gold, the the toilet pipes and stuff twenty four karat gold, the uh, jacuzzi had like gold. Thi- I'm like, there's no way you that twenty four karat gold. I'm just like, oh my god. So one thing to another to another. It was there's this purple shag carpeting all the way up. It was like an Austin Powers house. I guess I could I could uh, relate to it. But again, that was Pete. That was Pete. Everything that you know. Um, every even the final pictures I just saw of where he was living out in, in Vegas, yeah, all white. He's wearing all white. He's wearing totally all matched. white. Yeah, I mean, but he's he always had. Here's another thing. Like, okay, it's 2024. He's still wearing 1985 styled uh, jumpsuit, like uh, uh, athletic. What, what, what do you call him? Um, his Adidas jumpsuits. Yeah, but but what he sweatsuit. Yeah, he's so he's still sweatsuits. wearing sweatsuits. Yeah, the 83 year old man. He's still wearing sweatsuits because he thinks he's cool. It's not broke, don't fix it. That's right. That's right. And the, and the, the sad thing for me is how frail he looked. The yeah. one thing about Pete was he looked like a construction worker that was working a jack, just got off working a jackhammer. Four arms. Okay. Yep. His mother cut his hair with a with a spoon, and it was a bowl. Yep. And, he, and now it's time to go out and, and be like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna have a low cut shirt on. You're gonna see my chest hair, my hundred thousand dollars worth of chains. Hell yeah! You know you're not gonna know I'm a jackhammer guy. You're gonna think that like I'm the dance king. Then I'm gonna walk in there with my whole silk outfit on. That was Pete. That was Pete. And and he, you knew like when he got on the bus, when he wa- got on the airplane, and it it wasn't just the hit king. He was the king of the room. Like he and, and that's how he had to be. But once once you he settled that. No, we just be we can be boys. We can we can hang out and stuff. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back, do the first dibs question of the day next.